Welcome everybody to the third out of four webinars in the series of brought to you by Presentation Guru. I'm John Zimmer and with me is Jim Harvey and we are two of the three uh, co-founders of the digital magazine for public speaking Presentation Guru. The website is presentation-guru.com and it's a news magazine. We encourage you to visit it. The reason we call it The Guru is because it's actually the articles are written by dozens and dozens of people, some of whom are with us here on this call. We want to get as many opinions and viewpoints on public speaking as possible. So that's where the name comes from. As I said, this is the third out of four webinars. And we followed a format whereby we took a, a three-part approach. In the first two webinars, we talked about how you can create strong stories and both storytelling itself, the structure of a story, the elements that need to go into a story. And then we also talked about making your language sing, making it really memorable for your audience. The last session we used talked about rhetorical devices, nine rhetorical devices that anybody uh, can use. Today, we're going to talk about what you see in the middle bullet, and that is how to use simple visuals simple slides and how to use them well. And this is an important subject because PowerPoint and other slide presentation software is so prevalent today. And yet there's a sad reality when it comes to PowerPoint and people who use it. And that is that unfortunately, most PowerPoint presentations aren't very good at all. Are they, Jim? Uh, they're not. No. In fact, we'd probably be a little less polite than that. That in the vast majority of, of business cases, the, the visuals that people use actually hurt the speaker, hurt the message and hurt the audience. And I guess what we're going to be what we're going to do today is get to the nub of some of the things that get in the way of creating and using simple visual aids in support of your of your message. Um, we wanted to start just in a, in a sort of slightly weird way in some ways and say, this guy here, George Bernard Shaw, um, probably the greatest um, British philosopher of the, uh, the 20th century, said that the United States and Great Britain are two countries separated by a common language, uh, which is probably true and, um, and also quite funny. And we thought that in some ways, in, in the world of presentation, you've got a similar problem in that you've got most presenters. Now I'm making an assumption that you can correct me on, but most of us who start presenting, we're not graphic designers. And most graphic designers are not presenters. And that means that there's often a gap between graphic designers who are creating visuals for presenters to use and presenters who are using visuals that graphic designers have designed, no more frequently seen than with salespeople. That you'll, you'll go to work with a big corporate company and you'll do some presentation or some pitching work with a group of very experienced salespeople and you say, right, show us your materials. And they'll say, well, there they are, but we don't use them. Why not? Well, because we didn't design them. The marketing team designed them and they're rubbish. You know, no client ever. So that is, a, it's, a, it's a problem. And essentially, what graphic designers are really good at, because they're designers, is that they can sometimes build beautiful slides that don't work for the audience or for the person presenting. And the other thing is sometimes true, and I know in my own development, sometimes as a presenter, you do your best, so you create ugly slides and often those ugly slides, and this is an example from real life that we'll come back to later, that don't work for the audience. So you can get a very skilled speaker working with beautiful or ugly slides that just don't work to help you get your message across. Mm. And these are some examples of visuals and I, you don't need to read them. And Adrian, there's a guy called Adrian Wilton in the audience. Uh, you might, I've, I've anonymized all of these visuals, but Adrian, you might recognize this from 10 years ago. The animations come from the same organization as well. But imagine trying to talk through some of these to an audience, okay? My favorite slide. 
And um, this is a really this is a really interesting slide. These are all real slides from the real world. And we'll come back to all of them later because at the end of this, we're just going to give you some of these using your experience and knowledge and some of the things maybe that we've talked about and say, right, how would we fix these? How would we create them so they're better for the audience, but also use them in a way that's better for the audience too? Because yeah. you can have a really good visual that you don't use very well. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So let's come back here, go right back to fundamentals and ask ourselves, why do visuals matter? Um, and I was at a conference about seven or eight years ago um, where this lady, Dr. Carmen Simon, who I think is Colombian, she's a neuroscientist and she spoke for 30 minutes and she was very good. Um, and there were two things that I remembered. She was talking about the neuroscience of visual communication. And the first thing she said, which I think is hugely important for all of us is this. The moment that somebody begins to multitask, i.e. do a second thing whilst they're doing a first thing. And this is a really interesting thing. She proved it with um, photographs of brain energy. Um, that 40%, okay, 40% of that person's functioning IQ. So ability to process the information that they're receiving through all of their senses is lost. So imagine you have an audience's full attention. You're gonna take them through a complicated but important set of data. You have their attention while you're speaking and you show them a slide like some of the slides that we've just seen and you force them to process that second set of information through their eyes with their brain. Mm. That simple act that we do, all of us have done it and all of us will do it again, makes it harder for the audience to do the things that we want them to do. Listen. Mm. And Jim, if, you, if, if we consider where you and I are starting with IQ, 40% loss is massive for us, for you and me. And by the way, Mike uh, made a comment. Uh, actually, Dr. Uh, Dr. Simon is from Romania, he says. Oh, is she? Okay. You got the IA at the end of the word correct, so it was close. Colombia, Romania was good. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'd have too much to drink at lunchtime. It's always a possibility. That's another thing that takes away your IQ. There's a health warning that you weren't expecting. Mm. So, that was the first thing. Poor visuals force an audience to multitask, which makes them probably 40% less interested. One slide in a 20-minute presentation, they won't care. 30 slides in an hour's presentation, they can. you lose your audience completely. Second thing that Dr. Simon said, um, we, is this, pretty slides without brain science are just forgettable. Beautiful and useless, ugly and useless. So what we're gonna take you through is, I guess John and I's opinion it's only an opinion about what we think the best brain science related issues are when we want to create and we want to use visual aids in support of the messages that we're creating we, we've set out what we, we thought about all the things we could talk about possibly talk about when it comes to designing good slides and we we decided to distill them down in, in, into six rules and these are things that anybody can do and that everybody should do when it comes to working with any slide presentation software the first three of the rules are going to relate to creating the visuals what are some tips when it comes to creating the visuals? And then the final three are gonna be, how do you actually use them when you're up on stage and you've got the audience in front of you? Now, before we get into the rules though, we have to talk about something that everybody knows instinctively that they shouldn't do, but they do it. It's like if you've ever gone on holiday and to some place where there are cliffs and you see the, the, the signs, and, and I'm guilty of this, stay back from the cliff. You see people constantly inching forward, getting down on the ground, crawling just to take a look over. When it comes to PowerPoint, there is something that everybody 
I, I shouldn't say everybody, not everybody, but a majority of people in my experience do far too often. And they make this mistake. And Jim and I have created this very sophisticated algorithm. You can see it here to help you remember a key point. PowerPoint is not the same as a document. It's not the same. They serve two different purposes. One is to be meant to be seen on a screen as a supporting tool for a speaker. The other is a takeaway document that is typically longer and more complex. But to think that you can make, combine the two in some way, no, they don't serve the same purpose. There's a really um, sticky quote from Nancy Duarte that says, a good presentation should make a poor handout and a good handout should make a poor presentation. Uh, you know, it's, it's the, probably the most commonly asked question from all of the people that we talk to when we get onto the subject of visuals. How do you reconcile that I want to leave something with them and also show something to them? Lisa Marie said that it's a big pet peeve of hers and, and of many people, it's true. I tell people, I say, look, if it's good on screen, it'll be of some use afterwards, but people will need more information. If it's good as a takeaway document, it'll be terrible up on the screen. So that's the first thing. The second thing that far too many people do, something else that most people know that they shouldn't do, but they do, it's kind of like walking out in a thunderstorm, not the safest place to be. That is loading up the slides with too many words. And what happens is what I am sure is happening right now. Some people are looking at my, me and the screen speaking. Some people are reading. The attention is split. And then of those who are reading, some are at the top, some are fast readers, they're already done, some are in the middle. So we're all over the place. If you show a slide like this, or worse, you are forcing your audience to make a choice. Either they listen to you and forget the slide, or what's worse, they read the slide and they forget about you or they don't focus on you. So these are two things that we, overarching bad habits that really people need to work on. It's a really, it's a really, a really good point. If we talk about impact, you know, the impact that we as a human being have left in the room after we've gone, if your visuals are poor, your impact is reduced. It's as simple as that. And that really is the, is the, the thought to take us into the next part. Back to these six rules. Three for creating and three for using visuals. Whatever your religion in terms of PowerPoint or Keynote or Google Slides or Prezi, yeah. the principles are exactly the same. Mike made a good comment. I, I just want to pick up on it. He said he lamented, I think, how nobody uses the notes section in PowerPoint or Keynote for a handout. And for those who don't know, a speaker, you can add notes that accompany every slide. I don't like to be tied to a computer and reading notes. However, and this is what I think Mike is alluding to, you can have very simple slides. You can have a whole bunch of detailed information in the notes. And then if you give your slides out as a handout, you can give them with the notes. So the speaker gets your slide, but they also get more detail in the notes. They can be printed separately, as Mike says, absolutely. So let's move on with the six rules. So let's start with the ones when it comes to creating uh, for presenters. And here, actually, here are the three rules when it comes to creating slides. One idea at a time, three second rule, illustrate and emphasize. So let's take a look at them in turn. One idea per slide. As a presentation uh, trainer, coach, somebody who works with a lot of companies and organizations, a question that I get all the time is the following. John, I've got 45 minutes to speak or an hour to speak or 15 minutes to speak or fill in whatever time you want to speak. How many slides should I use? And my answer is always the same. I don't know, six, 29, 13, 50? I don't know. The number of slides is not important within reason, of course. If you have a half an hour, you can't show 500 slides. 
But people mistakenly think that there is some magic ratio of number of slides per time allotted. In my view, too many people make the mistake of trying to cram too much information on a single slide, thinking, hey, it means I have fewer slides in the presentation. But the reality is, it's harder for the audience to see. As Jim says, it lowers the functional IQ, and it just makes the slides crowded and, and, and wordy. So if you have three ideas, like we see in, in the example here, show them on three slides. Give each idea its own space. It doesn't, it's not gonna take you extra time. And the only extra time it takes is the time to click to advance the slide. That's it. What is that, a microsecond? That's it. In fact, I think it'll take you less, it'll take you less time to show three separate slides because then it'll be easier for your audience to grasp the key idea within every slide. So one idea per slide, let the slide, you know, take, if you have three ideas, take three slides instead of one. One of the things we'll come back to later in next week when we're talking about performance, <clears throat> that if you have a larger number of slides, you can separate the ideas and you can move from a, a supporting idea to an emphatic idea, a key message, using the space between slides. So you can, uh, you can breathe as a speaker, which affects how you feel and it affects your voice, but you can also use the sort of drama, for want of a better word, of a gap between one point and the next point, as we'll see beautifully demonstrated with some videos of great practitioners later on in the podcast, later on in the podcast. So one idea per slide, one idea at a time. John, that's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a classic. It's really important. And Lisa Marie is already anticipating the blank button, calling it magical. Hold that thought, Lisa Marie. We've done something that I think you'll be very happy with. But before we talk about that, let's talk about the three-second rule. Imagine you are driving on the interstate in this case, or on the auto route, or on the autobahn, or wherever you're driving. And from time to time, there are going to be panels appearing in the distance and moving closer and coming into focus. You don't have a lot of time to look at the panel, process the information, and then get your attention back on the road. In fact, you should be able to get everything in about three seconds. So if you're driving down the highway in the US, I think we're in New Jersey with this site, Trenton, New Jersey, you can look at this and very quickly you can see coming up in a mile, there's a turn off to the left, Turn off 22, that's going to take you to Trenton, but otherwise you can keep going ahead on the 495. And then you pass the sign and you go. And your slides, if you design your slides with these auto route signs in mind, it's going to help you create slides that are more visual and quicker to process. I was thinking there, John, with your illustration, imagine how difficult that is when you've got three children in the back seat who are asking you questions and chatting at you at the same time. So your ability to process that sign goes up when somebody else is talking as well. So in a presentation sense, if you're going to, this, this rhythm of, if you want to show them something, show them something and give them three seconds to process it before you carry on talking. Mm -hmm. But you can convey a lot of information that you can go back to in those three seconds as this road sign uh, illustrates beautifully. Yep. And if you do these two, you know, if you apply these first two rules, it's going to really help you when it comes to illustrating and emphasizing the point you want to make. So Jim, why don't you talk to us about that? We're showing you a picture of Steve Jobs here. I and mean, This might be controversial, it might not, but I, Steve Jobs was Steve Jobs. Was he the great, greatest speaker in the world? No, he wasn't, but he was Steve Jobs. And he was working with fantastically created stories, with beautiful visuals, and all he had to do was stand up and not fall off the stage, you know, and be Steve Jobs, which is pretty important. If there is an organization that communicates essentially following the rules that have been laid down as over thousands of years, Apple is a great organization to follow. They use their visuals to do two things, to illustrate a point that the speaker is making and add emphasis to the point, nothing else. They don't use the visuals to convey extra information, to introduce new topics. They don't put things on the visuals that they then don't go on and talk about. Illustrate and emphasize. 
And John um, reminded me of this yesterday, which is the example here from the MacBook Air launch decades ago now, which is probably only 12 years or something like that. There was a key point that they wanted to illustrate and emphasize. And we're just going to show you the visuals that they used. The key point was this, that their targeted competitor for their market, high-end professionals uh, with enough money to pay, was a Sony product. The Sony was the thinnest product on the market. And one of the things that they wanted to emphasize with the MacBook was that it was thinner, lighter, more powerful, more able than any other computer uh, laptop on the market at the time. So they started off by saying, this is the profile of the Sony VAIO. I think it was, I might be wrong. Okay, and they gave you the dimensions. Then they showed you the relative dimensions of the MacBook Air. They showed it to you. And then they emphasized the difference verbally. It's the beautiful use of the, some of the rhetorical techniques we talked about last week. They said, so the MacBook Air, the thickest part of the MacBook Air is thinner than the thinnest part of the Sony VAIO. The That's visual right. raised the idea, the verbal mm -hmm. emphasized the idea, and because there was one idea per slide, waited for and presented like that, the key message landed with a resounding thud. It was beautifully done. The greatest communicators use their visuals for illustration and emphasis and almost nothing else. If we want to create better visuals as we do, we've just given three things that we think are really important, just really simple things to do practically. And John and I, we're not selling ourselves here as designers. We are presenters that want to have more impact. And the only things we've done here today are the things that PowerPoint can do from within PowerPoint. Yes. There's no tricks. So why create better visuals? If you do, don't make your audiences multitask. Don't mess with their memory. Don't stop them remembering the most important things that you think are relevant to them. And don't make them choose between you and your slides. Because if you do, everybody loses. What were those three things again? One idea at a time, three second rule, and use your visuals for illustration and emphasis only. That's the end of the first part of the sermon, for want of a better expression. Anybody like to add anything? Because we have some hugely experienced people in the audience. What do you think? Is there anything we've missed? Is there anything you'd like to reinforce before we move on? We, we actually do have a question from Gazoo, from, who's joining us from Brazil. Obrigado, Gazoo. Tudo bem, I hope. There you go. That's the extent of my Portuguese, other than trying to find the beach in a restaurant. Uh, Gazoo says he agrees with the point about it, the slide should illustrate and emphasize, but in a technical presentation, sometimes it's hard to keep this framework. And I, and I told him, I said, I agree, but it is still possible. And, and what I think, a couple things on that. In a technical presentation, one of the key factors that will influence how technical you as a speaker can be on stage is the sophistication of your audience. If you're talking about a technical subject to an audience of technicians who are very familiar with the subject, the, you can be a little bit elastic with the rule. You can put more information, more complex information on a screen, I believe. However, I still think that there is value in taking things, for example, very technical process, taking them step by step, just as you can animate bullet points that you sometimes see people do, you can also animate steps in a, in a, a flow process or building a certain machine, you can bring in the different parts one by one. The key thing is to remember that when you're presenting, 
And we could do a whole other webinar on this idea of, of making your ideas stick and the whole idea of the curse of knowledge. Many times the speaker, you know the subject so well. You may have given this presentation a dozen times. You may have been working on this presentation for the past three weeks. You know it so well that you forget. You forget what it's like, what it was like when you knew nothing about the subject. And I don't care what you speak about. There was a time in your life you knew nothing about it. So if you keep this in the back of your mind, if you think to yourself, if I were in the audience and knew nothing about this, would I be able to understand it? I'm sure you can find ways to bring things in bit by bit. Yeah, there's um... So Heno says, hi, there's a good clip on YouTube called Death by PowerPoint. It outlines some of the same ideas being discussed here. They emphasize using a darker background color and slides to create, whoops, it's lining up now, to create more poise. What is our take on using darker slides? So two things, the, you're right, the, um, the, the death by PowerPoint um, is a really good presentation by a Swedish guy with an English name, uh, David J. Phillips. Um, yeah, and he says a lot of things, most of which I think we are, I would agree with, but, and no point disagreeing on the other things because they don't matter. Back, dark slides for background. He talks about contrast. Um, and uh, the, our sort of corporate, set we always use black backgrounds why because we travel around the world into rooms where the lighting is rubbish uh, the projector might be terrible the television screen might be awful and so we have found that if you use high contrast white on a black background you get the very best reproduction even with the worst um, audio visual equipment um, I, I think the most important point is high contrast. So dark colors on a light background, light colors on a dark background, you get, you kind of get the best of both. Perfectly valid, but high contrast rather than being slavish about dark backgrounds. The other thing, and we've all seen it as well, some, a color that looks great on your laptop when you're designing your presentation. You walk into a cavernous conference room you project it and that color that looked like a bright green has disappeared completely. So I think always design with the end reproduction in mind rather than what's there. We have, we have a few more comments and questions, so I'm gonna take them and maybe a little bit out of order, but we will do them yeah. all. So Bob, uh, Bob Moore, he said that when you present three ideas, you don't necessarily have to use three slides if you build one, uh, if you build one slide point by point. And I would agree. It, let's take the example of bullet points. Too often, a speaker will just throw up a slide of four points, and they're talking about point one, and everybody is reading down. So again, we're at different places. So you can bring in, this is where an animation is actually useful. And please, nothing flying in or zipping around or burning up or exploding, just a nice fade or a nice appear. Bring them in one by one. A variation of the technique that I, that I use is to show all the points, if it's, each point is very short, there are four things you need to remember. This, 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 this. Let's look at them one by one. Then I will go in subsequent slides and look at them in a bit more detail. Jim, Ramin asks, what about having more text and reading it out to the audience? Or in smaller workshops, have a one person read it out loud. Would you recommend that? I don't like to be completely certain, but I just think no. I always think that supervised reading is kind of what we used to get when we were reading stories to our kids. Let's say you're doing a complicated legal presentation about employment law, for example. There might be a paragraph that you want the audience to read. So there might be a case of putting it on the, on the screen and giving them 30 seconds to read it um, for themselves. So I could see how that might work. But usually, even in a paragraph like that, there'll be three or four words or clauses, it being a legal thing, that you just want to emphasize. So yes, there are times when it would work, but broadly speaking... Generally, no. Yeah. I like this idea that you say about let people read it. Yeah. And then what I, what I have done, if I memory serves, I, I, I've shown one slide out of many, a, a, a paragraph. I said, let's take a moment, let's read this. And it's all in black font. And then I say... I want to focus on the key concepts here or concepts. And then with a click, you can change the, the color of certain words. So you can draw, the paragraph is there, but now these keywords stick out and it really draws their attention a little bit more. But reading to them, no. Uh, Lisa another Marie. Thought, another thought from Oliver, Oliver House. Hi, Oliver. Um, I always have trouble with white background, high powered projectors and reflective screens. Yep, I think that's true. 
Uh, I think sometimes a dark background is better for, well, for everybody in the audience, if it's particularly powerful. That's a very good point. And Lisa Marie asks, can you address the question of good slides for use in a video conference? Different available space, less engaged listeners? Yeah, I mean, it's something that we've tried to do here, actually. That I think one of the things that we realize with webinars, I think, is that you do, you do need more visuals and to move through them more quickly as a general rule of thumb, webinars and video conferences and what have you, yeah. Ignace uses a different metaphor than the auto route. He says the headline in a newspaper, it's yeah. short, you can be scanned, yep. Very good. I think in many ways, and certainly in the next section, using visuals, I think we can learn from the professionals. And I'm, I'm not saying that we're not professionals, but the people that put the television news together, that show you a presenter with in a virtual studio with a... Follow the things that they do, unless it's CNN where you've got, excuse my language, shit flying in from all over and all kinds of stuff there. One idea at a time, small number of text, visuals to illustrate and emphasize. It's a masterclass every night on our televisions. And the article that we've written in support of this, uh, that's on Presentation Guru at the moment, goes into some detail about some of those principles of using. I just want to mention one more thing, and then I think in the interest of time, we'll move on. Mike said, talked about the power of the pause. Yeah. And even though we're not talking about that in this episode, it is without question, Mike, one of my top, I'd say top three things every speaker should master to become a better speaker. The ability to stand on the stage, say something to an audience, and then just look and stand there silently for a few seconds. It is captivating for an audience. You look better, and as you rightly suggest, the, you give the audience time to process and internalize what you've just said. 100%. And, okay. and I agree, and Bill, I don't, you don't need your logo and presentation title date time on every slide, yes. And it, it always cracks me up, Bill, when I work with a company where you have an example of a company employee giving a presentation at the company to other co-workers at the company. They're all employees and they remind each other on every slide that they work for company ABC. I agree, but we need to move on. So three rules to use slides better. So the first one, synchronize the words and pictures. The second one, use the blackout slide or the blank slide or the white slide. And thirdly, you give all of your energy and attention to the audience. We used an icon of somebody resuscitating, uh, uh, resuscitating a victim there because if death, you know, death by PowerPoint, exactly, yeah, death by PowerPoint, resuscitation. That's quite good actually. Death by PowerPoint equals resuscitation by presenter. So let's go on. Let's crack, crack on. on. So synchronize words and pictures. I'm just going to show you. We're just going to show you a video. We think this is a world class demonstration of how to use good visuals. There's the sound in the video, it's only a short clip, we won't watch all of it, but there's just some points beautifully made. And I always think, in my own life with my children, when I'm challenged by a dilemma, they've done something or something needs to happen or a rule has been broken, I challenge myself, I ask myself, what would Nelson Mandela do? It's a pretty high bar that I usually undershoot enormously, but I think about it's important to have role models. And when I'm creating visuals and I'm presenting, I ask myself, what would Steve Jobs do? So we're gonna look at the most important presentation he ever made. 1984, we introduced the Macintosh. It didn't just change Apple, it changed the whole computer industry. We're not, so right at the start, the prologue of his speech, it's a massively important point. They want to introduce this notion of revolution to, as the launch pad for this, this world changing product. One idea at a time, one simple image reinforced by the speaker. Take it away, Steve. <laughs> In 2001, we introduced the first iPod. And it didn't, just, it didn't just change the way we all listen to music. It changed the entire music industry. Well, 
Today, we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. The first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. The second is a revolutionary mobile And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. I love that bit because I think it's easy to deify Steve Jobs and Apple. But, you know, there's no question in my mind and in John's mind, they got those products in the wrong order because by the time they got to a browser, the audience kind of went, Meh. It was anticlimax. Okay. And that's the way it was. And if, for those who were on the webinar last week when we talked about use of the tricolon, this idea of the, 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 the power of three. And if you end with the longer phrase and, and ideally the, more, the, the, the more, most powerful one, it's much better. So I think he should have started. It's a new uh, server, it's a widescreen iPod, and it's a new phone. Because that was the one that got the biggest applause. Exactly. What we'll also see, there's a couple of other things. Notice how they're using the visuals for the, for the punch and then you know, for the jab and then the verbal for the right hook. The knockout comes from there. And there's an, another bit where Steve Jobs doesn't quite get his timing right, but we'll look at it. But the, 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 the point is still made beautifully about visuals for illustration and emphasis. So, three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, today Apple is going to reinvent the phone. The, I, the, the iPhone thing coming up, that was the first time the, word, the world had heard this word iPhone. And then they had a really important message, which was today Apple reinvents the mobile phone. And what did Steve do? Did anybody notice? He talked over the applause. You know, as John as a stand-up and myself as, a, as having done, you know, a fair amount of stand-up comedy as well, the one thing you do when you've got them is you let them laugh. You don't interrupt them. That's the one area here, the only thing really, where, where he missed the punch. There was another visual headline. He could have waited for silence, let them read it, and then really nailed it by saying, today, and they've already seen it, but they want to hear it, Apple reinvents the mobile phone. Anyway, beautiful. Let the laughter run, let the applause run, and you start talking just before it dies out completely. Yeah. So we'll scroll on a bit. And just, just because these are the slides in this, in this piece, I think that are most like some of the things that real people in real meeting rooms all across the world have to deal with. But this is probably the most complicated visual that you would find in Apple's technical presentation. So let's just look how they use it. Right? How many of you do that? I've got more than a few. So we want to let you use contacts like never before. You can sync your iPhone with your PC or Mac and bring down all your contacts right into your phone. So you've got everybody's numbers with you at all times. We have something that's going to revolutionize voicemail today. We call it visual voicemail. Wouldn't it be great if you didn't, if you had six voicemails, if you didn't have to listen to five of them first before you wanted to listen to the sixth? And the point, illustration and emphasis, the detail comes out of Steve Jobs' mouth. And going back to that thing, the place for detail is in the air between the speaker and the audience. The mm. place for the structure, for the emphasis, for the illustration is the visual on the screen. Yeah. And, and, for, they, 
Yeah, and if I can relate this back, this ties into Bob's point. We can see, maybe Jim, if you can just back it up so we can actually see the screen. Just yeah, scroll, cool. it, scroll it a little bit forward or back. This is what Bob was talking about, that yes, you can bring in the points one by one instead of having them on separate screens. Where this works the best though, is you'll notice that each of these points are really sub points related to the phone aspect. Jobs has a separate slide for the phone and the iPhone and the server, but within those slides, he's then separate points for each one as well. Yeah. And there's a point, there's a thing here from, uh, excuse me, uh, CK Peter Chua, I think. Uh, I told students bullets are for a gun and no bullet points are allowed on slide, only one point idea per slide. Um, this works for design students, but business students don't seem to get it. I think one of the messages I think that business students need to get is that bullet points work in a written document that you're reading, but they don't work as a visual aid because it's not how we process information. We go left to right, not top to bottom. I mean, unless, this, unless the points are very short. And again, that makes yeah, you Exactly, like these kind of things. The key is in the phrase, bullet points, not bullet paragraphs. Illustration and emphasis and beautiful synchro. It's almost like he knows what's coming next. And I think lots of times presenters actually, because they're not that sure what's coming next, they have far too much on the screen. So, John, point two. Use the blackout. And really, the blackout is, think of it as the visual equivalent of the pause. It's a very simple technique that you just turn your slide black. And to do that, you can either, you don't have to write the word blackout, by the way. You can, with the remote, there's usually a button where you can click it and make the screen go black. And then you click it and you come back to that same screen. If you don't have the remote, and we can talk about this another time, why you should get comfortable with a remote. If you walk up to your computer, in and it's showing the, the presentation on the screen if you just hit the b key that will make the screen go black if you hit the w key it will make the screen go white i find white is too harsh on the eyes and i think all that's of when you're in present mode when you're, only in, present when mode. you're in present mode not edit mode otherwise george w bush would never have been able to see his pc screen exactly and I got to tell you, uh, years ago, I gave a presentation at the uh, University of Lausanne, and I had to use their computer. So I uploaded my presentation, I had my remote, and I'm going through the presentation, and I would click it, the black button, and the screen went white. And so I could click out of it, and I tried again, still white. So I nonchalantly wandered over to the keyboard, and I tapped the B key, and it was white. And so I just didn't use it. At the end, I'm packing up. And it hit me and I thought, John, you're an idiot. Because of course, the Université de Lausanne, French University, French operating system, B stood for blanc, white. I hit the N key and sure enough, it went black because in French, N is for noir, black. So if you're, if you're in Germany, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, Schwarz for black and um, Weiss, so it's still W, but whatever language your keyboard is set up in, that's, the key, that, that's the key that will work. Okay. Test it, test it. And if you're worried about it, as Bill says, put a black slide in between. That's the other thing I was going to say. The nice thing about inserting a black slide is that you click into black and you click out into the next slide. Now, it means that you have to know your slides, but that's a very effective thing, and I do that a lot as well. Yeah. Okay. And this leads us to the final point, which is energy and attention to the audience. You are not, have you ever been to a presentation of Paul Dutrin where you have the speaker is, oh yes, and as we can see up here, we have such and such happen, and then all of a sudden you have a dialogue here. And what's worse is when the slides are bad, when the slides are bad, they become like a black hole because the speaker himself or herself gets sucked into them. And I've worked with dozens, hundreds of people at different companies where they demo a presentation and every time there is just a god-awful slide full of text I walk up I hit the B key the screen goes black and I say the computer just broke give us the information without the slide and I kid you not every single time they do it better I asked their colleagues in the training everybody says you it was so much better you talked to us you explained it more simply so this is all about talking 
to the audience. Look at the audience. If, if we can see the next slide, Jim, if from time to time you need to check what's on the screen, that's fine. Just simply stop talking, turn, turn back and continue talking. You can avoid having to turn back at all if you become comfortable using presenter mode. And this works in both, in both a keynote and PowerPoint. Presenter mode is where you have your computer in front of you, as we can see on the screen right now. And what you can see is the current slide, but you can also see the next slide coming. And you, you can, can also see your notes if you want to have notes there. You want well. notes. But what I use, I, uh, on Keynote, I use typically Keynote. I, I just like the software better. I have the current slide and I can si resize the slides. I have the current slide, which is small. I have the next slide, which is big. And I have a timer. And that's you also, John, you can also here, as I've just done there, is you can actually, while you're still presenting, and so the slides are still showing, you can scroll through the whole of the rest of your presentation and go to a particular slide if you want to. Which we, which we may have to do, given the time. Yeah, no, we'll be good. I think we're good. We'll so go. I'll switch the presenter view back, simply just by display setting here, swap presenter. And again, that only displays when you're in present mode. But I tell you, it is so nice. And like to, to try it, like, I don't have the control of the presentation right now, but when you are speaking and you're talking on this slide and you can say, and that leads me to X and you click the slide and X appears without you turning, it's like a magic trick for the audience. And it's not a trick at all. It's just a technique you become comfortable with, you become proficient at it, but it adds this polish to your presentation and it keeps you engaged with the audience. Sorry, Oliver says, uh that uh, his German power in his German PowerPoint, it's still B for black screen. I think that's right. I was going to say, I think it is B. Yep. I think you, the Germans should be complaining about that. Actually, it's your cultural right to have Schwarzers. Um, those three things, synchronize the words and pictures, use a blackout slide and give your energy and attention to the audience. We've got a little test for you now, given these are genuine examples of, of, challenges that clients have given us. We'll just take 30 seconds and just either shout out or type out. What would you do if you got to about the design and potentially the use, but let's focus on the design for the moment. If you got this, it's part of a sales presentation. It's an important part where you're moving to why we're brilliant and why you should use us. And everything appears at the same time Looks like four different slides to me. One idea, innovation. Agreed. Yeah, I think so. What else? You Using show. symbols, absolutely beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Keep the up on the left, describe the rest. I think that's a perfectly valid thought as well. Okay, good. So all of it, I will just crack on through this. This is what this is what we did, and what we've done here. Is we've done two versions one the easiest thing that just uses stuff in powerpoint i'm not saying this is what we would do so using smart art take each at a time and work through a point at a time and build up a complex slide so one idea at a time um one idea per slide now you might hate that but that's better than the thing you did before john Yep, and Morrow is actually, he, Morrow makes a suggestion, I know, wait a second, where is it? Yes, Morrow says use images symbols, which I think flows nicely into the next. It does. So, and again, this next slide, so we gave you, you know, a better version of this. That took about five minutes to fix that slide using cutting and pasting from the original and putting it into smart art. Better, okay, four things. Innovation, experience, savings, journey. You could just use that slide. Now this, for those people that have got the more modern versions of, um, of PowerPoint, you just put four bullet points in, you click on design and then design slide, and from magically, the slide is redesigned for you, as long as you've used the placeholders like this. But then you can go on from there if you want to, and you can go, if you want to, for each of those things, you don't have to. I animated each one, in the previous ones, I've just done it here to get us through. So you've done the same thing, but you've separated, you've used the icons, 
and you can go into detail if you want to there. I'm not recommending either, but that's what you can do. Example two. This well, is well, a well, example two. I just want to just a couple, address a couple of issues. Henry asked the question, what about using the pointer? And I'm not a big fan of the pointer, Henry, the laser pointer. It's absolutely terrible when you use it on words because that means you've got too many words. But too many, too many times people wave it all about. I would rather design clean slides and only in the rarest of occasions use the pointer. If you're using a pointer, it means that the slide isn't clear enough that the audience can find it on its, on its own. There is one place where a laser pointer is absolutely brilliant. And that is for amusing your dog or your cat on a rainy afternoon when they can't go outside. They will chase it for hours. It's beautiful. Um, but as a presentation aid, I, I'm not a big fan. I was joking, by the way, Tricia. Tricia looks very serious at the moment. I wasn't suggesting that you actually do. Anyway, what would we do for this? This is a real slide. Uh, this is a real slide. Um, uh, yeah, what would you do? Symbols for the main highlighted words. I think so. Absolutely. Just, I mean, just make it a little bit. You, there's something about some of the language as well. It's, it's not a medal award. What does that actually mean? But anyway, so yeah, you could use symbols. You could build things one at a time. And this is, this is what we did. Simple. And again, we just used PowerPoint as it is. We're not designers. We just used the capability. So we did this. We used an image of the iconic... Um, uh, foyer of the building that this was for Antonio Pooch of fragrance and uh, perfume manufacturers in Barcelona. We changed the title a little bit and we used smart art again to just give the four categories. Mm -hmm. There is no designing in that at all. We used the photograph and we used smart art. Okay. Can I, it, yeah. can I just pick out a couple of quick comments because a whole bunch have flooded in. So Mike, and I, he talked about graying out items already covered. This is a, a great technique if you have yeah. an item come in and then you move on to the next one, you gray the first to give the second one prominence and so on down the road. Lisa Marie says that for her negative text, white text is a lot less legible. And she says, no. And I would partially agree with you. I. I like white on black, but when there, is very, there are very few words and you can make the font bigger, then I think it's very dramatic. But absolutely, if you've got more, then it becomes a bit harder. Uh, Bill said, oh, Aurora, I encourage my students to call slides just that, slides or visual aid, because if they call them the presentation, they give them way more importance than they have. And then our last slide, Jim. Oh, wait, one more. Lisa Marie asked a really good question. And this is something I always tell people as well. At, before we get in, I get into, or Jim and I get into longer trainings on slide views, a question that we ask is, do you even need slides? Yeah. Because sometimes maybe you don't. Sometimes maybe you work off of a flip chart or a whiteboard. Mm. Or sometimes, how is this for a radical idea? You stand up and you actually just talk to the people. How refreshing would that be? Yeah, slides are great, but they are a tool. And like any tool, you need to use the right tool in the right way for the right job. Okay, example three. This is a real one. Uh, Adrian, if you're, uh, you recognize this. So this is a really important part of a sales presentation. You're gonna ask them for a lot of money. You gotta show them they're gonna get back much more than the money that they've got. Um, so what would you do with this? And there are examples coming in, they'll continue. This is what we would do with this. I think for me, if it was this pitch, you'd say, look, the electric motor. You've got 746 in your factory. It's a massive opportunity for savings. And 64% of your energy consumption, the millions of pounds you pay a year is consumed by electric motors. We can help you with all of those things. How much does a motor cost to run? Let's have a look. 64,000 per motor over a 10 year life. And 98% of it is electricity. So what can we do? <coughs> if we manage a 10% speed reduction for you, that will give you a 27% saving. That is 24,000 pounds over a 10 year life cycle. And if you reduce the speed by 20%, 
that's fifth that's thirty thousand pounds per motor multiplied by 768 over 10 years <coughs> okay so <coughs> and all of those things whether you like the design or not i'm not we're not entering up putting ourselves up as designers we're simply saying what do we do one idea per slide one idea at a time visuals for illustration and emphasis <coughs> excuse me and then synchronizing those things okay what have we got the final example this is our, our, my, my all-time favorite slide this is a real slide very quickly if we can see it this is a slide <laughs> that appeared that shows the strategy for the u.s uh, army and government in iraq if we can pull that up jim certainly can and there it is. And this was the subject of an article in the New York Times, General Stanley McChrystal. He was just apoplectic, I think, at how incredibly unhelpful a slide like this is. Now, a slide like this, just you can look at it. It's amazing. It is actually breathtaking to behold. This slide can be both a brilliant slide and a terrible slide. It's a terrible slide if you are expecting anybody to follow any of these arrows to come to some understanding of, of the process flow of whatever it is. However, if you have a slide that you want to show to people to say, the way we are doing things is too complex. Just look at this, boom. This is what we have to deal with. Then it's a fantastic slide because you are showing it for the purpose of emphasizing the complexity and here's the demo here's how you could use it for that okay here's how you could use it for that for me this is almost like a blank screen this is our strategy we're going to show you this thing and the message it gives you is the message we want it to give you are you ready for this this is our strategy it is horribly complicated that is the only message. Now, there is a hope if, however, we manage to control that, if we understand that, and if we truly, anyway, I'm not gonna go on and do it because I don't know what I'm talking about. Even the worst visual can be used to make a message in a really powerful and memorable way. And, and what Jim did just there, it's a, it's a good piece of advice for anybody who has to show a graph or a chart. It's okay to show these things, but typically you're showing it because you're emphasizing either a trend in a graph or perhaps one key element of a graph or a chart. If that's the case, highlight or circle or put in a different font the figure or the aspect that you really want to make the point about to the audience. Audiences, even on a complex chart, it's not an Easter egg hunt. They shouldn't have to hunt for the key information. You've got to make it as easy for them to find. So even on a relatively complex slide, keep in mind this three second rule. If you can show a slide, but have the key aspect of the graph or chart in red or green or some color that sticks out, do that. It'll draw people's attention to it. So Mike, you say that's Mike Hanlon. Hello, Mike. That's where the new Zoom in PowerPoint comes in. Funny you should say that, Mike, because what I want to show you is when it comes to visuals, beautiful isn't always good. Good isn't always beautiful. And there's a difference between useful and not very useful if you're a designer or if you're a presenter you have to understand how an audience processes the information with speech in order to make visuals that work in a good way now for those who were there last week this is an example of what rhetorical device beautiful isn't always good and good isn't always beautiful give the answer john uh not antithesis antimetabola which is a version of chiasmus, a crossing. And for those that want to see last week's uh, podcast about nine rhetorical techniques that we think every speaker should understand and use, it's on the Presentation Guru website and YouTube page and we posted it. So John, beautiful isn't always good, and good isn't always beautiful. And we end with a demonstration of Zoom and what is, for me, it is one of my all-time favorite quotes, Leonardo da Vinci, 
simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Okay. And just to go back there, um, for those of you that, that haven't seen Zoom, Zoom in Office 365 uh, as part of PowerPoint gives you the ability to stack hide slides inside a picture like this and you can either click on it so I can have slides hidden there I could have slides hidden there and if people ask me about something if I just click on the symbol it will take you to the next slide I could do it <laughs> Sorry, the obvious place to click. I'm not. Well, did I'm you see? You, you didn't see Lisa Marie's comment. She said, "I was afraid you'd zoom in even more." I was going to say we did. We did have a we, we did have a conversation about whether we should do another zoom in. But you can. I shut that. Jim down. Yeah, multiple <laughs> times because it was juvenile and childish, and some people would have found it offensive. So anyway, um, so that's the the conclusion of the the sermon from the two of us. Because we are here for another. 15, 20 minutes if you want to be. But if you all leave the uh, the thing now, thank you very much. We started five minutes late. If you're here next week, could you be here on time? That would be really helpful to all. So much. It was wonderful. Pleasure. Thank, thank you for everybody. Stay safe and healthy. Hope to see you next week. Bye, Toby. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, 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 thank you. thanks you. again. Thanks again. Thanks again. Last minute. Yeah. Oliver, no. bye. Bye, Mike. Thanks, 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 bye. I got bye. you here at the last mic. We got thanks. you here in the end, Mike. Yeah. Bye, Aurora. Bye, Mike. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. So, bye. Cheers, Mara. Ciao, Mara. Anch'io. Ciao. So, I think we can stop recording there, John. Yes! High five.